and the exocrine the exocrine, exocrine part of the pancreas is like um 80 percent the cells that makes up the exocrine gland of the pancreas are about 80 percent okay 80 percent from what yeah somewhere and then the 20 percent is what makes up the endocrine so in today's session we want to talk about that very same 20 percent but it is high yield and um like for you to become a doctor like if you understand the thyroid you understand the adrenal glands and you understand the pancreas you realize that when you go in your year four those are the things you be and the pituitary as well did i forgot to mention the pituitary the pituitary is the the mother gland of the endocrine okay it is the one that is able to control all the endocrine <laughs> organs okay so you need to know the pituitary gland in and out okay both in anatomy and histology or in anatomy and physiology okay anatomy they'll be asking you about tissues which tissue is found here what type of cells are found there and a bit of hormones they'll ask you about that physiology will be exclusively about hormones and how this pituitary gets to control these other uh, lower <laughs> organs like the adrenals and the thyroid so you need to know your pituitary in and out okay the hormones that are produced on the anterior pituitary the hormones that are produced on the posterior pituitary you should also know the hypothalamus remember the hypothalamus is the, the one that controls the pituitary yeah, it starts with the hypothalamus so hypothalamus is the one that controls the pituitary and then the pituitary is the one now that controls all the other endocrine organs with an exception of one what is that organ that is not controlled by the pancreas the, by the by the pituitary it is the pancreas the pancreas is, has, um, is independent it, uh, it has nothing to do with the pituitary or the pituitary has nothing to do with the pancreas okay so the pancreas does its job does its own things without any input from the pituitary but the thyroid the adrenal glands these ones they are controlled all regulated by the pituitary which is as well regulated by the hypothalamus okay i think we can start i was just doing like a overview as i was waiting for people to to come in so that is the topic of uh, today endocrine physiology the pancreas okay so like i said the pancreas as an organ is divided into two in terms of the the cells okay a 98 percent of the cells 98 actually not nine the 90 i said 98 percent of the cells are the they are the ones that makes up the exocrine pancreas okay those enzymes you guys were doing under git all those all those enzymes you know the juice that the pancreas produces i think i even spent a, a, a session uh talking about how bicarbonates are secreted by the pancreas and the like all those things happen in the exocrine part of the pancreas okay the 0.2 percent is the endocrine part of the pancreas but it is very important why is this part very important because of diabetes diabetes is the most common disease worldwide in zambia almost every family has someone with diabetes so as they have someone who died from diabetes so it is very important like as i'm teaching this topic i know there's a part of passing but taking keen interest to also understand this topic because a year from now even two years from now and become a clinical student it will be easy for you to understand uh what is going on when you start going to 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 to, to, to the words okay so let's uh, go a bit into histology about the pancreatic isolates and remember throughout my presentation today's session i'll only be talking about the endocrine pancreas, pancreas okay i'll be talking about the endocrine pancreas it means the cells i'll be mentioning in this slide as long as they are part of the pancreas they are of they are, they are of endocrine origin and not exocrine All right i hope i'm recording okay i'm recording so the pancreatic isolates so that those that, that is the name given to the cells that makes up the endocrine part of the pancreas okay pancreatic isolates so these cells also called as isolates of lung hands there are a lot of them two percent but that two zero point two percent is like a lot okay a lot 
in comparison to other things, okay? So there are about five, uh, four types. I would say four types, five types, yeah. There are about four types, uh, types, that, uh, types of cells that makes up the uh, pancreatic isolates, okay? The first types of cell, the first type of cell is called the beta cells, okay? The beta cells are the ones that produce insulin. Beta cells of the pancreatic isolates of Langer hands are the ones that are able to produce the insulin, okay? We also have what is known as the alpha cells, okay? So these alpha cells are the ones that will produce glucagon, okay? Since you did, you did, uh, you may, um, you covered these two to, these two hormones in biochemistry. Can someone help us with the difference between insulin and glucagon? These are the hormones that were fully covered in biochemistry. Someone to help us with the difference between insulin and glucagon functional wise. Uh, are you able to get me? Yes, yes, I'm able, I'm able to get you. Sure. Yes, so if we have, um, if, we have, if we have more than normal um, concentration of glucose in blood, insulin is secreted so that uh, it facilitates the conversion of uh, the glucose in blood to glycogen. That is stored in the liver. Then we can go do the other way around. There is less uh, glucose in blood. Uh, glucagon is secreted so that it uh, facilitates the conversion of the glycogen that is stored in the liver back into blood so that there is uh, that normal stabilization. Thank you very, very much. And that's very correct. Okay. So the, uh, basically, what he said, we'll go into the details uh, concerning these two hormones in today's session. Okay, at least I just want I just want to, wanted to see if people have an idea uh, when it comes to these hormones. Okay, so whenever you eat something, you have high glucose levels in blood. The, the hormone that will be produced by the pancreas is insulin, so it facilitates the glucose uptake. Okay, that's what happens. In a case you are hypogee, through the whole day you are in your dear dissect. You do guys don't dissect. You are waiting for your session to to come up so that you, you do your DR. And then you, are, you, find, you find that maybe you woke up without eating anything. So your levels of glucose in blood do decrease. So when the levels of glucose of, the levels of glucose in blood decreases, the hormone that will be released is glucagon, okay? So glucagon prevents hypogee, okay? Because if someone, hypogee, hypoglycemia is an emergency. If someone faints or has symptoms of hypoglycemia because they haven't eaten, it's an emergency because if you, are, if you don't do something, their brain will just, they, they will be injured to the brain, should I say, to just make it simple for you guys. So hypogee is not something that is very good. Okay, try by all means to avoid it. So in summary, glucagon is released when glucose levels in blood are low. Insulin is released whenever glucose uh, levels in blood are high. And Mishek now went on to explain exactly what gets to happen when you have high glucose and the storage and then there's glycolysis and everything like that, okay? And then you have the delta cells. So the delta cells, they usually produce somatostatin, okay? Somatostatin. I want you at your own time to read about somatostatin just a bit, okay? Just a bit, I mean, I want you to read about growth hormone. Growth hormone is one of the hormones we won't teach. Okay, so growth hormone is produced by the pituitary gland. I want you to read about it because whether you're writing online or you are going to write physical, those questions that will come, whether MCQs or whatever, they will have uh, questions concerning growth hormone. So at your own time, whatever book you use, try to read around uh, growth hormone, all right? And the relationship growth hormone has with this somatostatin, uh, so the, the somatostatin that is produced by the T cells. Okay. All right. That was just a camera intro. 
I hope everyone, we're all on, the, we're all on the same page. Now, let's dive in into the insulin physiology. What do I mean by insulin physiology? The whole topic is physiology, but what do I mean when I say insulin physiology? I mean insulin functions, okay? Now, this would be e this will be easy because it's something you already covered in your biochemistry, okay? So it's about just knowing the functions of the insulin. So what does insulin do overall, okay? So number one, it is involved in carbohydrate metabolism, okay? And our friend, uh, Mishik, as Pasha, he talked about it, okay? So I said, whenever you have high glucose in blood, what happens? Insulin is, pro is released or produced, yeah, it will be released, not produced. Production would have already happened. It would have been stored in the vesicles, but whenever you have high glucose in blood, it will now be, those vesicles will be released, okay? So when they are released, this insulin goes to the muscles and the adipose tissue, okay? Tells them to uh, take up that glucose in, uh, from blood. When that, the adipose tissue and the muscle tissues take up that glucose, there is an enzyme called exokinase, and that exokinase is the one that will actually activate the glycolysis pathway. You know all the 10 steps from there, okay? So that is the meta. So overall, you can see that what are you doing? You are building up something. Whenever insulin is produced, you are building. So that's the reason why insulin is also called an anabolic hormone. Whenever insulin is produced, the aim is to build up something. Look at what's happening whenever muscles get up that insulin. They will, they, 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 the aim is to build up something. If it goes to the liver, the, aim, the liver will store it as glycogen. That's building up something, right? That is anabolism. Okay? So now, what happens? So this is what happens, right? Insulin is produced by the uh, pancreas. For the muscles and your adipose tissue to be able to utilize that glucose, there should always be insulin. Without insulin, your muscles or your adipose tissue cannot use up the glucose. Okay, and uh, uh, for the liver, liver, liver does not is independent. Like it, the liver can take up the glucose from blood without insulin, but for the liver to to be able to store that glucose, for it to be able to convert it to glycogen, it still needs insulin. I'll repeat, you have glucose in blood. For that glucose to enter your muscle tissues or your adipose tissue, you need insulin. While tissues like the pancreas itself or maybe the liver, you don't need insulin for that glucose to enter these tissues. It just, the glucose will just diffuse from high concentration, which is the blood, to lower concentration. Once it enters the liver, for the liver to be able, able to convert that glucose to glycogen, you still need insulin because those enzymes you guys learned in your biochemistry, they have to be activated by insulin. Those are, I'm trying to pinpoint, because those are the MCQ questions you'll be getting. So take note of this, these small, small details, okay? Now, what happens in a case where there is insulin deficiency? Someone, let's assume, someone is unable to produce insulin or whatever reasons there is no insulin, okay? What is going to happen is that what controls, we now know that what controls glucose levels in blood is the insulin. Lack of insulin, it means the glucose levels will increase. And whenever you have high levels of glucose in blood, that is called hyperglycemia. And when you have hyperglycemia, if you go back to the kidneys, we say that in the kidneys, we have sodium glucose 2 transporters. They make sure that all the glucose that has been filtered within the glomerulus is reabsorbed. Now, when you have hyperglycemia, there will be a lot of glucose that is being filtered out within the glomerulus, and they will fail to reabsorb all of it. So some of it will pass and uh, will, 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 will be excreted as urine. And whenever you have glucose being excreted in urine, we call that as glycosuria. Okay. Number three, glucose is an osmo is, is an osmotic molecule. By osmotic molecule, what do we mean? 
it contributes to the osmolality of uh, fluids. So imagine if someone has a hyperglycemia, water will start following glucose. So it means someone who has hyperglycemia will end up having what is known as uh, dehydration. What type of dehydration? Can someone remind us what type of dehydration can be seen in someone with hyperglycemia? Just visualize the Shima table for cellular fluids or fluids compartment where water is moving from the ICF going to the ECF. What type of dehydration was that? Do you guys remember that topic? You've already forgotten that topic. The first ever topic we did, either in class or here. I hope you've, you you are getting my, I, I hope no one is lost and all of us are on the same page, those that are in class. I'm trying to explain what you can see when there is lack of insulin. I don't want you to memorize, but I want you to understand. I've explained how hyperglycemia comes about. The muscles and the adipose tissues will fail to get that in, uh, glucose. So a lot of it will remain in blood. So if you have more than normal levels, we call it hyperglycemia. Then I went on to say, if someone has hyperglycemia, all that glucose is going to the nephron, to the kidneys. It gets filtered uh, within the glomerulus, okay, into the tube, into the nephron. The, in the nephron, the proximal part of the nephron, you have the sodium glucose co-transporters. But they will fail to reabsorb all that glucose. So some of the glucose will be lost in urine. So that is called the glycosuria. <laughs> Okay. Then the other component is osmotic, osmotic diuresis. So I said, glucose itself is a, an osmotic molecule. It means where, 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 wherever it is high, water follows. So in a case someone has hyperglycemia, it means within the blood, within the ECF or the plasma, you have a lot of glucose in there. So water starts moving from the cells to the ECF. Now, I was asking, what type of dehydration is that? Okay, so you've forgotten. So at least you've understood. So since you're writing your name. Hyperhydration. Hyper? Osmotic dehydration. Hyperosmotic. It's very as simple as that. It's hyperosmotic uh, dehydration. Why? Because... The ECF has a lot of, there is high osmolality. Yes, there is high osmolality. Yes, uh, Johnson has also answered it. There is high osmolality in the blood. So water now moves from the ICF to the ECF. And you know, the cells are now losing, they are losing water. Okay. So now what happens is that when you have a lot of water in the ECF, all that water will be filtered out by the kidneys. Okay. And then when they go to the kidney, when you go to the kidneys, the sodium glucose transporters, like I said, they'll fail to reabsorb all that glucose back to, into the blood because they will be saturated. So what will happen is that in that filtrate within the kidneys, you have a lot of glucose. And again, glucose will, will draw water. So remember, 67% of water has to be absorbed, uh, reabsorbed within the proximal tubules, right? A lot of it will fail to be absorbed because glucose is as well having an, a negative effect. So water will just remain within the nephron. So someone will end up urinating a lot, will end up uh, producing a lot of urine. So if someone goes to the toilet and then they produce a lot of urine, that is called polyuria. Okay. This, space, this person I'm talking about, they were losing water because they, there was this osmotic, hyperosmotic uh, dehydration. Because the cells are being dehydrated, the brain tells this person who, is, who has hyperglycemia to say, go and drink water. So these people will be drinking a lot of water because of the fact that the cells are being dehydrated. That is called polydipsia. Then, insulin is not there. The muscle cells are not using up that glucose because muscle cells, cells and the adipose cells
can only use up that glucose in the presence of insulin. So these muscle cells and the adipose cells are starving despite being surrounded in this pool of glucose. They are starving because it cannot enter without insulin. So this again triggers the brain and tells the person to start eating. They will ever be eating and eating and eating. That is called polyphagia. Okay, so I hope you've understood what polyuria is, what polydipsia is, and what polyphagia is, and not just memorizing, but linking it to the physiology, to the science. That way, you, even if you are given 30 seconds per question in your online exam, at least you'll be able to answer. Okay. We move on to the other function. So I was talking about the, uh, the carbohydrate function. Now we move on to the other function of insulin, okay? So lipids metabolism. So what does it do to the lipids? Remember I said insulin is anabolic, so it has to build up something. So it means these lipids, I mean, insulin promotes lipid synthesis. It means the glucagon, whatever I'll be saying, by the way, is, uh, is opposite to what glucagon does, okay? Whatever uh, insulin does is just opposite with what glucagon does. So I'll assume whatever I'm saying, I've already talked about glucagon. Okay. So, um, yeah, so insulin, wh how does it end up, uh, how does it uh, cause the synthesis of uh, lipids instead of uh, lipids being oxidized? Okay, it's because of the fact that the insulin ends up inhibiting a hormone called the lipase enzyme. Remember, lipase is the one that breaks down the lipids, okay? So once that enzyme is deactivated or inhibited, then the reaction that will be encouraged is the one where you need to synthesize uh, lipids, okay? So... That's what happens. Now, what happens in a case where someone has, uh, there's no insulin or there's lack of insulin? If there's lack of insulin, it means this lipase enzyme will keep on breaking down the lipids. Remember, it, it is the one that breaks down the, the lipids. And there's no insulin to antagonize it. There's no insulin to stop it. So it will start breaking down these lipids into fatty acids. These fatty acids, they will go to the liver. The liver will take up this fatty acid and then to start forming uh, trigacylides and the very low density lipoproteins. Okay, these triga t t trigacylides and very low uh, density lipoproteins, as they are being manufactured or synthesized, if we go a bit back to biochemistry, you realize that oxidation of fats, fatty acids, you end up having acetyl CoA. Then after acetyl CoA, you end up having um, acetyl CoA will be converted to what? Malonyl CoA. Okay. Then now that malonyl CoA, what happens is that there will be a lot of these acetyl CoA, malonyl CoA. So what happens is that the cells or the liver cells or any any tissue that is utilizing these fatty acids, it will start forming a lot of ketones. So some of it, some of these acetyl CoA is deviated, and then you end up forming ketones, Acet acetone, aceto, acetone. Okay, we remember those. I hope you guys did those things in biochemistry. This time around, they'll be asked in physiology because of all this. Okay, so I hope you've understood. I'll repeat: deficiency of insulin, or when there's insulin resistance. Because insulin promotes li li uh, lipid synthesis, that will be inhibited. That pathway for synthesizing lipids will be inhibited. Then the enzyme called lipase enzyme will take an advantage and will start breaking all these lipids okay, into fatty acids. These fatty acids will go to the liver. The liver will start oxidizing them. So it's called beta oxidation. The details are what you now need to memorize for a biochemistry exam. Okay? Then in that process, the overall molecule that ends up being produced is acetyl CoA and then acetyl CoA, malonyl CoA. If there is a lot, if you have a lot of acetyl CoA and malonyl CoA, it will be deviated into ketogenesis, and then you end up producing ketones. Okay, that is the summary. Protein metabolism. So, what does insulin do to protein uh, metabolism? Remember, like I said, 
insulin is an anabolic, anabolic hormone, meaning it promotes building of things. So in the case of proteins, it means it promotes the amino acids to be converted to proteins. That's what it does. So it, whenever you have insulin, the muscles will be able to take up amino acids. The, muscle, the other cells will be able to keep, take up amino acids so that they can build up proteins. Okay? Now, what happens in a case where someone does not have insulin? When you don't have insulin, it means the cells or your own body will fail to build up proteins. So a person with insulin deficiency or if there is resistance, they will be wasted. As simple as that. So I hope you've understood these three. Those are the questions that will be coming in your MCQs most of the times, okay? So take note of these small, 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 small details, okay? So that is the physiology. There's another one, last, uh, last physiology that is very important because that is why now we're linking it to the uh, renal, okay? Ins insulin has an effect on the, um, oh, insulin has an effect on the, sodium potassium transporter okay so whenever there is insulin this sodium potassium atp pump or atp yeah, atp pump is activated and whenever it is activated you know what this do what this does okay sodium out potassium in so in a case where there is high levels of insulin in someone's blood what do you expect to see you end up having hypokalemia because this insulin also has an effect in the sodium potassium ATP pump, so it will be activated, overactivated, and then to start getting out of so little sodium, sorry, that is in the ECF, taking it into where it is already a lot, and then you end up having what is known as hypokalemia. This this has answered questions that were hard when you guys were in term one. Okay, it was hard to understand some of these things, but they were coming as the uh, MCQs in your test ones and. Even the physical test that was cancelled, the one you wrote, some of these questions came in. But at the end of the year, if you are going to write your final exam, it will be easy to answer questions like cellular, those that are found on cellular fluids. Okay? So these are the things I want you to, a take-home message, okay? I want you to understand the function of insulin on all these four uh, uh, pro, uh, molecules, okay? Carbohydrates, what does it do? And in a case where you don't have it, what are the outcomes? I want you to appreciate that. I want you to appreciate the effect of insulin on lipids. And in a case where it's not there, what do you expect to find? What are the effects of insulin on proteins? And in a case where you don't have insulin, what do you expect to find? Okay. What is the effect of insulin on uh, sodium potassium ATP? Okay. Let's now talk about glucose transporters. Again, this is something you already covered in biochemistry, I assume. I hope Baba, Shari Babu did a good job. I don't know if she, she, she's the one who was teaching me. But uh, my assumption is that you, they did, okay? Now, this, is the, this time around, you'll be seeing these questions in physiology. If uh, endocrine questions come, like they bring same CQs, this is the time where I want to see this transporter. So, there is, this is a crossover between biochemistry and uh, this is a crossover between uh, biochem and uh, physiology. Okay, so I want you to appreciate the transporters that are involved in the glucose uptake. Okay, so there are five transporters. Okay, this is a revision to most of you. There are five transporters, but I want you to, to from these five because we are talking about insulin. I want you to take note that out of these five transporters, only one responds to insulin. From these five transporters, they are called GLUT, by the way. They are, they are abbreviated as GLUT. So we have GLUT 1, 2, 3, up to 5. Okay, Out of these five, there is only one that is dependent on glucose, and it is GLUT 4. So insulin-dependent glucose uptake is via GLUT4. It means for these GLUT channels, there are transporters, there are transporters. There are, it means for, so, for glucose to move from blood into a cell, there is need of insulin. Insulin has to bind to this transporter, activate it, 
and then it will now move from blood to the, the cell, inside of the cell. These other ones, GUT1, 2, 3, 4, five, oh, GUT1, 2, 3, and 5, they are insulin independent. They do not depend on insulin, meaning they can work on their own without insulin. Now, you need to know the locations of, uh, like, where you get to find these GUT uh, uh, transporters, okay? GUT1 is, you find it in the red blood cells, you find it in the blood brain, blood brain barrier and in the placenta. Okay, you know that the fetus also, as it is developing, you study the organogenesis. You know those organs are developing. The cells in there they need glucose. So how does glucose move from mother to 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 the fetus or the embryo? It is via the GLUT1 because they are all over all over the placenta. Okay. The GLUT2s, they are the ones you get to find in the liver, the pancreas, okay? And the, I will come back to the pancreas. The pancreas has those, and we'll talk about them in detail, because this is now endocrine. Then you also find them in the small intestines and in the kidneys. If you were with, even in class, if you were, because you wrote your test three, and on you know, it means you are up to date, you read. The apical side of the... The cells that are found in the kidneys, you have uh, sodium glucose transporters. And then the basolateral side, that is where you have the GRUT2. So when the sodium glucose transporters in the kidneys, they reabsorb, they get that glucose from the from the rumen. It goes into the cell, but it has to go to the blood via GRUT2. So these GRUT2s are also found in the kidneys. These GRUT2s are also found in the small intestines, pancreas, and the liver they are independent from the insulin then the blood threes are found in the brain all the almost all the cells of the brain they are they have blood three okay as well as the sperms so it means your brain does not need insulin for it to be able to use up glucose and that is the reason why when someone is has hypoglycemia hypoglycemia meaning low levels of glucose because you haven't eaten Immediately give them zigolo, anything that has uh, sugar, like uh, Coca-Cola, you actually resuscitate them. Because immediately, just, uh, immediately someone takes up uh, any, any drink or sugar or sucrose, the, once it enters the brain, the brain does not need insulin to be released. It will just pick up that glucose and then to start using it up. And then someone will actually recover in seconds, immediately are given that glucose or sucrose or drink. Why? Because the brain has GLUT threes and they are independent from insulin, and then you have GLUT fours. These are insulin dependent. Okay. Remember, I was talking about the muscles and the adipose tissue to say that for them to be able to pick up that glucose, they need insulin. Yeah. These GLUT four pro uh, GLUT four these GLUT four proteins or GLUT four transporters. They are the ones that are found in muscles and those adipose cells. So someone who has issues with insulin, these good force will be affected and the muscles and the adipose tissues. Let me just say all the cells that are, have a GLUT4, they will be affected. GLUT5 is also uh, insu is the insulin independent but it is found in the small intestines. Okay, fructose absorption uh, uptake for the small intestines to be able to do, to pick up fructose, they use up uh, GLUT5 as well as glucose uh, itself. Okay, so this is a summary of all the GLUT uh, transporters. I think I've explained them. In biochemistry, they usually ask. Uh, uh, this is addition to. In addition, uh, these are additional notes for biochemistry, where they ask you about affinity for each glute and the like. Those are the questions that usually come in biochemistry, but unlikely. You know. Do you have a question? Do you have your mic?
Okay. All right. Let's now talk about the secondary active transport. So these glue channels I've mentioned one up to five. The type of diffusion is facilitated. There is a protein called the glute that is helping this glucose to move from high, which is blood, to low, which is inside the cell. Because this glucose cannot pass through the cell membrane. You did that lab. So it always needs a, a transporter. So this is just diffusion, high to low. But there are times where glucose needs to be uh, transported from low to high. So when glucose is needed to be transported from a low concentration to high concentration, the type of transporters are called sodium glucose transporters. Okay, These are not new, especially the sodium glucose transporter too that is found in the kidneys. We talked about it. We even talked about the, the drug that can inhibit this uh, transporter. Okay, so there's, there are two of them. Sodium glucose transporter one is the one that is found in the small intestines. It is, it is used by the cells to carry glucose and galactose absorption. So I want to take, I want you to take you note know, because the MCQs will come, uh, they, will, they can confuse you with it. the absorption of galactose and the absorption of fructose. Take note that fructose is uh, taken up or transported by the GLUT5, which is facilitated diffusion. But for galactose, you use, the cells end up using sodium glucose transporter one. This is the small intestine. Don't confuse these two. They are two different, okay? So in a case, it, my MCQ pops up. In your, either your, it will be physical or it will be online. If it pops up, remember that. And then the GLUT2, the sodium, sodium, uh, sodium glucose transporter tools. These are the ones that we talked about. And um, uh, Reno, I won't even waste my time on these ones. But I still had to put the drugs for you to remember the drugs that gets to inhibit sodium glucose transporter tools. These ones here. Okay. I, I also added them in the Reno notes. Okay. So this gamma diagram shows you now the cells from different sites, okay? Uh, particularly the hepatocytes. So you can see this is the hepatocyte here. So you can say the hepatocyte has GLUT2, like we said. GLUT2, okay? Um, the pancreatic beta cells, it also has GLUT2, okay? Then in the intestines, they have GLUT2. You can see there's a GLUT2 here. They also have GLUT5. Okay, and I said GLUT5 is used for glucose and fructose. You can see from this diagram showing you glucose and fructose. In addition to GLUT5, they also have GLUT2, just like the hepatocyte and the pancreatic beta cells. Okay, and then now this GLUT2. Now take note where the GLUT2 is, because again, that is where an, an MCQ can come. The GLUT5 is on the apical side, meaning your, if, if this is your small, if these, are, if these cells are in your small intestines, your, the things that have to be absorbed are here. So this is the apical side of the cells. Then the basolateral side is here, meaning the blood is somewhere, uh, is somewhere here. So whatever is absorbed here has to go into the cells and taken to the blood. Now, I want you to appreciate to say that GLUT5 is on the apical side, while GLUT2 is on the basolateral side, it means when glucose is ab uh, re -ab absorbed from here via sodium glucose transporter, okay, or the very same GLUT, uh, yeah, via glucose sodium transporter, when it's about to go, yeah, the very same GLUT5, when it's about to go to the basolateral side, to the blood, it will use a GLUT2 to come out from the cell. When it was entering, it was using GLUT5 and the sodium glucose transporter one. That's what I wanted you to appreciate. The very same thing is seen in the kidneys, those proximal cells. So when he, this is your rumen where you have your filtrate, okay? They want to uh, reabsorb all the sodium, this, uh, the glucose via sodium glucose transporter. So it will be reabsorbed via SGL2. Then once it is inside the cell, it will be taken to the basolateral cells via GLUT2. So take note of these small, 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 small details. And of course, GLUT3 is in the brain, brain cells, although there is no diagram here. All right. So far, anyone who is confused, anyone who is not with us, are we all on the same page? 
those that are in class. Let me be checking. Usually people usually ask questions in the comment section. Okay, there are no questions. Uh, we together. Any questions? If you cannot, if you are, maybe you are in the library and you cannot unmute yourself, you can post it in the comment section, and I'll be able to I'll be able to read it. Okay. okay. All right. So now let's move on to Miss B. Yes, yes, you can go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Doc. Can you just come again on the transportation from the top, from the Apico and the Beso side? Okay. So I wanted you to appreciate the transportation in the intestines and the kidneys, okay? Because these are the ones that have like more than two types of transporters. And I want you to appreciate which where we, each of these transporters is located, okay? So apicos a part of a, an epithelium. When, when we say apical part, it means that part is the, facing the rumen. In the case of the intestine, the rumen is that space where you have your digestive for fluid. So that has to be reabsorbed by the, the cells of the small intestine. So the cell that part of the cells that are, that is facing the rumen is called the apical side. Now in the small intestines, glute five, the gamma, if you're able to see the diagram, if you're unable to see, you can actually I was told that you can zoom. Yes, perform. I'm zooming and it's clear. You can zoom in, you will see that there's glute five here. That is in red, okay. So the group five is in is on the apical side, and then the group two is on the basolateral side. What are the functions of group five and the SGLT1? If you go back to the notes, we said group five is an insulin independent glucose uptake in the small intestines for absorption of glucose via facilitated diffusion. It also uh, absorbs fructose. And then we went on and talked about uh, uh, sodium glucose transporter one. It, uh, they are present in the small intestines for glucose and galactose absorption. Now, going back to this diagram, when glut 5 and the SA SGLT1, they have absorbed that glucose, it goes into the cell. But it has to be taken to the blood because the aim here is to take this glucose into the blood so that other cells can use it. That's what absorption means. So once they are inside, they, once that glucose or whatever the fructose is inside, once the glucose and the fructose are inside, they have to be taken to the blood. Now they use the GRUT2. And I wanted you to appreciate to say that GRUT2 in the intestines is found in the basolateral side, while GRUT5 is found on the apical side together with the sodium glucose transporter. One, that is in the intestines. The same thing can be seen in the kidneys, except the kidneys do not have GRUT5. They only have GRUT2. Okay, so the GRUT2, just like in the intestines, is also found on the basolateral side. Remember the kidneys, these are the proximal cells of the convoluted tube. They have to reabsorb all that glucose that gets to be filtered out. It has to be 100% re, uh, reabsorption. So when it is uh, reabsorbed, it goes into these cells and it has to be taken to the blood via the GRUT2. That's what I wanted you to appreciate and I'm hoping this is it's now clear. Yes, thank you. Okay. All right, so if there are no further questions, we now move on to the mechanism of insulin release. Very important. That is now the physiology, okay? We've been talking about insulin. We've talked about its functions and some of the proteins which it targets. Now, let's talk about how it is produced by the pancreatic cells. Remember, these are the beta pancreatic cells, right? So this gamma cell you're able to see on your screen is a gamma, a, a gamma typical cell that is found in the pancreas the endocrine part of the pancreas and it is the beta pancreatic isolate over longer hands because it is the one that produces insulin so how is insulin produced first of all we know that it is produced by the pancreas where on the pancreas the beta cells okay now what is the physiology how does it happen all we know is that when there is high levels of glucose in blood so when these intestines where you've eaten your food it goes to the intestines whatever you've eaten that has carbohydrate these in, uh, small intestines will reabsorb, oh, we will absorb the glucose, and the glucose will now be high in blood. So at this particular point, this glucose is in high in blood, is high in blood. But how 
does it get to stimulate the pancreas to release the insulin? This is now what I want to explain. Remember the pancreatic cells, they have group, group what? We said the pancreatic cells, they have group two, okay? Which is also found in the liver and other places. So the pancreatic cells have group two. Now, this group two, this group two transporter is unique. It's a bit different from the group two we saw in, in the small intestines and the group two we saw in the kidneys because it is attached to an exokinase two. Remember exokinase uh, as isomers, right? Those are the questions that are asked in biochemistry. There is exokinase one and exokinase two. Exokinase two is also called the glucokinase. The functions of exokinase are the very same thing. It's the same too. It starts up that glycolysis pathway. Okay, there will be phosphorylation of glucose and you know the, those ten steps. You guys are uh, experts in them. So now this glut two that is found within the beta cells, beta pancreatic, beta two pancreatic cells, is attached to the hexokinase two, also known as glucokinase. So remember, we said that group uh, glut two is independent of insulin. So whenever there's high levels of glucose in blood, whenever you just eat something and then there's high levels of glucose, that some of the glucose will pass through the GROT2 that are located within the beta-2 pancreas. And then once it is allowed, once it enters, automatically the glucokinase gets activated. And then when it gets activated, it is the one that will convert glucose, from, uh, glucose to glucose uh, 6 phosphate. From there, if those eight, nine steps will happen, and then you end up having what is known as pyruvate. Pyruvate moves into the mitochondria, then you have the uh, chain reaction, electron chain, uh, yeah, the electron, uh, electron chain reaction, right? Then it is, and you end up producing those the 36 ATPs, the ones we've been talking about, okay? Once you have those ATPs, these pancreatic beta cells, they have what is known as ATP sensitive calcium channels. So what happens if there's high levels of ATP in them, it goes and binds to the ATP sensitive calcium channels. And once the, the, the ATP binds to it, what's going to happen? It blocks the cal ATP sensitive calcium channels. Blocks, get, it does not activate. It is blocking. It means it was active. It was allowing potassium. Remember, potassium in any cell, potassium is high inside. So it will be go. It's uh, without uh, it being disturbed in a, in its uh, resting state. Should we say it is always allowing potassium out. Once the ATP is produced, that ATP goes and binds to the ATP sensitive potassium channels, and then it will be inhibited. When you inhibit this, pot, this ATP sensitive potassium channel, they, they, it means there will be accumulation of what? Potassium inside of this beta cell. The accumulation of potassium inside of the beta cells, you are depolarizing them. Okay, you are depolarizing them because remember, somewhere, somewhere, even if it's not, it's not here on this diagram, there, there is a sodium potassium ATP. Sodium potassium ATP. What does sodium potassium ATP do? Do it gets two potassium inside, three sodium outside. So that that pump is still working. It is still bringing potassium from the outside to the inside. This ATP sensitive has been deactivated. So there is slowly accumulation of what potassium, and if that is equivalent to is uh so oh, that is oh sorry there's um in, there's an increase of potassium inside the cell which is equivalent to sodium entering the cell in short you are depolarizing the cell okay when the cell has been depolarized these very same beta cells they have what is also, what that is what is known as the calcium voltage channels they are very sensitive to the change in the voltage. So in here, the voltage has changed because of the blockage of the ATP potassium, because sodium is oh, potassium. In a case I mentioned sodium, just know that I mean, I'm talking about potassium. So in a, so there will be accumulation of potassium, depolarization, and then they'll activate the voltage, potassium, voltage calcium channels. 
they will open just like what happens in the neuron uh, from here it's similar to what happens in the neuron there will be there will be opening of these uh, calcium channels influx of calcium when calcium enters you know that calcium is a second messenger so now calcium is the one that will trigger the vesicles that have insulin in them and then you end up having what is known as exocytosis so exocytosis happens because of the calcium that entered in the cell because of the depolarization of the beta cells as a result of the inhibition or deactivation of the ATP sensitive potassium channels okay so it means these cells they are, they are already prepared at this point they already uh, would have manufactured their insulin they will already would have stored it in the vesicles just awaiting for a signal to release them and that signal is always glucose glucose activates the glucokinase glucokinase atp is produced and inhibits the atp sensitive depolarization of the cell deactivates the calcium gated channels influx of calcium and then calcium is a second messenger to cause exocytosis of uh insulin anyone who is lost are we all good okay so if you look at this diagram i've explained i've literally explained almost everything that is on the diagram apart from one this side where it's written in great teams okay so it's another pathway that can be activated and when it is activated it can trigger the release of insulin so aside from the the one i've mentioned which is the main one there is another side one like the come aside uh, there is a question oh i thought there was a question yeah where so in creatines it's, it's a g protein you can see it it, it pass, it's passing through the cell membrane about seven times so it's, it's, it's a G protein. So in a case where in creatine, yes, oh, I thought that was a question. So in a case where in creatine is, has been activated, it, when in creatine has been activated, you should remember your signal in transduction where you have a G cupboard. What happens, those alpha, those details, we talked about them, right? But overall, just know that eh, those details you need to know for preparation for exam, yes. But overall, when in creatines are activated they will cause the calcium and then calcium will, will cause the release of the vesicles that have insulin that's what you need to know now i told you to go and read on growth hormone i mentioned to say go and read up on growth hormone growth hormone is produced by by the pituitary it can as well cause uh it can it 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 can it can um it has an effect let me just say it, it has an effect on the pancreas so i want you to find out uh, the effects of growth hormone to this pancreas and how does it get to you know cause that very same effect okay the, the answer lies within the very same ingredients okay all right now I've now i've now moved on to the other say, part of the presentation i'm hoping everyone is clear here I hope I've done a good job in simplifying it, okay? Case scenario, okay? So I'm doing this assuming Cine to disprove that you won't write online and then you end up having a case. You end up writing it on uh, physical. And then if you're writing it physical, it turns out that you have scenarios will be there. So I've highlighted some of the important things that you need to understand that are in line with what we're from learning about insulin okay this insulin when it is produced by the cells when it they when it is released outside it is not released it uh, alone okay in that vesicle it has another whole molecule called the c peptide so it means whenever insulin is pro is released in blood it is always released with a c peptide okay so there are scenarios you need to take note in a, like when i say scenarios i mean any of these four scenarios are possible to pop up in your exam okay because now you have you know that insulin is always released together with the peptide either either 
either via incretins or via the glucose uh, glucose kinase pathway. Okay. Point is that overall is that insulin and C peptides will be used together. Now, what happens in a case where you get someone's blood, you get someone's blood, eh? you measure insulin. Um, you measure insulin. You find that insulin is low. You measure the C peptides. You find that the C peptides are high. You measure the glucose. You may find that the glucose are low. What does it mean? It means that person has a type 1 diabetes. Diabetes, what does it mean? Diabetes just means you have high... Okay, hyperglycemia is high levels of glucose. But when it exceeds a certain point, I'll talk about the actual values you need to memorize. There is a figure where it, if it, reach, it exceeds that point, it becomes diabetes. So diabetes is still high levels of glucose. Now, there are different types of diabetes. Now, I'm telling you to say, in a case where you measure someone's blood, you find that insulin is not there, is low and detectable. But the C peptides are high and the glucose is high. It means this patient is failing to produce insulin. And because this patient is failing to produce insulin, the muscles and the adipose are, cannot, up, cannot uh, take up that glucose and then it remains high in blood. So high levels of glucose means that uh, no insulin in this case, okay? C-peptide, it means uh, insulin is being produced. Insulin is being produced. Oh, that pathway for insulin is okay. It's functioning, but the cells uh, are not producing insulin in that it's like that vesicle is empty it only had c peptide and then the c peptides were the ones being released that is type 1 diabetes scenario number two high levels of c peptides and low levels of glucose okay so c peptides are high insulin is high and the glucose um I think I, I made a mistake here. So it's supposed to be glucose high, C peptide high, and insulin high. That's how it's supposed to be. If everything is high, insulin is there, is it's in high amount. C peptides, because they're released by ins with insulin, they're also high. But glucose is as well high. What is the problem? The blood has insulin, but it is still high glucose. That is what we call as type 2 diabetes guys this type of diabetes happens in that it happened as a result of insensitivity the receptors that have that uh, that are supposed to respond to insulin for the GRUT4 they are insensitive they've become insensitive insulin is there but insulin cannot activate them so that type of that type of, I mean that means the patient to end up having high levels of glucose in blood. Not because they do not have insulin, but insulin is there, but the receptors are now insensitive. That is known as type two diabetes. So you can see the difference between type one diabetes and type two. Type one diabetes has to do with the insulin itself. There's a failure of producing insulin. Type two, on the other hand, insulin is being produced, the pancreas is okay. But the cells, the receptors of GLUT4, they are unable to respond to, to the insulin. High levels of C peptides and low levels of glucose. Yeah, this is now correct. So what, are, what about in a situation where insulin is high? C peptides are also high, which, is, which means the pancreas is okay. But then the levels of glucose are very low to an extent where someone ends up having hypoglycemia by law means below normal then it means that person has a tumor in their pancreas and that tumor is producing a lot of insulin and because insulin is produced by because insulin is produced together with c peptides there will be a lot of insulin and there will be a lot of reuptake of glucose and then this patient ends up having multiple episodes of hypoglycemia they will be fainting once in a while it's a sign that there is a cancer and that cancer is called insulinoma. Lastly, 
low levels of insulin, low levels of C-peptides, and low levels of glucose. What does it mean? Low levels of glucose or insulin, low levels of C-peptides. If the C-peptides are low and the, and the insulin is low, it means the pancreas is okay. It means, the, I mean, when I say the pancreas is okay, it means the pancreas is okay because it's producing these two in the, the amount, the normal amount they're supposed to be produced, but they're just low. And then again, glucose is low, which is not supposed to be the case. It means someone took up or was injected with it and insulin or a drug whenever you have everything low it means that person took up exogenous insulin exogenous insulin is a is a insulin that is not produced by the body maybe it was given as a as a as a drug so these are the four scenarios and i want you to remember them not only for your third year but remember them even when you become fifth years okay when you become seven by then 60 years or seven years when you start managing your patients all right any questions oh i'm thinking i'm good okay uh, so sorry. it's yes yes no sorry i wanted to ask you to repeat on the um, the the earlier no the other page i just had a compromise in my network and i think you couldn't get me yes the time when you're talking about the movement of calcium the depolarization and you talked about sodium and potassium and you said you were using them interchangeably so i couldn't quite get the right sequence because i wasn't sure where i was misplacing the sodium and potassium if you could just run oh. through all right so i was saying you know my brain what it does it says other things but i'm talking about other things so in this diagram, there is no sodium involved, okay? No, sodium has no role in this diagram. So I was saying in a case I, I, I mentioned sodium, I, I actually meant potassium, but in this diagram, I take home message that sodium is, has no role in this uh, diagram. So what happened is uh, glucose has been taken up by the GRUT2 within the pancreatic beta cells. And then it this automatically activates the exokinase 2, which is glucokinase that is found, uh, which is an exokinase that is found in exokinase, glucokinase is an exokinase 2 that is found in the pancreatic beta cells. And then this will now convert that glucose all the way to pyruvate, and then the pyruvate goes to the mitochondria, and then you end up having those 36 ATPs. High levels of ATPs will inhibit the ATP sensitive potassium channel. If you look at the arrow on the diagram, it is the, without, uh, in, a, 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 in a normal state, like without ATP, it allows sodium to go out. When ATP is around, it will be inhibited. Okay, it will be inhibited. And when it is inhibited, it means there will be accumulation of potassium. Potassium inside the cell will cause depolarization of the cell. When the cell has been depolarized, just means that the resting remaining potential is becoming more positive because of the positive ion accumulation of the positive ions. This will now trigger the voltage calcium channels that are very sensitive to any change in the resting membrane of the, these cells. Then there will be influx of calcium. Calcium is a second message. So what does it do? It is the one that goes to the vesicles that already have the C-peptide and the insulin. Okay, there is a whole lot of uh, physiology that gets to happen, but assuming that it was already taught in neuroscience, the first part we did. Point is that that calcium will just be exocytosed. It means, oh, that vesicle, so it will be exocytosed, and that is how insulin and the C-peptides are released into the blood. So whenever you have high levels of glucose, automatically this is activated. And then insulin will be uh, released outside. And then the second mechanism was where incretins are used, this side. So they, there could be a hormone, there could be a hormone that can bind on the incretins and then it can activate the incretins. And then when it is activated, it will produce camp. You know, this is a G carport. Eventually, end up having camp, and then camp, the endoplasmic, the endoplasmic reticulum, yeah, endoplasmic reticulum, smooth endoplasmic reticulum will, pro will produce calcium. And then that calcium will go to the vesicles and cause release. So these are the two pathways. But this other one 
happens in the presence of hormones. So now this type of receptor is called incretin. Now a take home message, a take home message concerning your MCQs, possibly in a scenario, in a, either way. There are drugs that works on incretins and there are drugs that works on this. The drugs that works on this one, I'll spe specifically mention this one, especially because I've seen it in MCQs. They are called sulfonurios. Sulfonurios, okay? Sulfonurios. Those are the drugs that will act on this. What does it do? It actually, um, they will, when you give that, those very same drugs called sulfonurios, they will act as if they are ATP, so they will be blocking this, okay, desensitizing this or two. You depolarize the cell, you, you, there's more depolarization, and when there's more depolarization here, then you end up having um, a lot of the insulin being secreted. That's how, you, uh, that's how some of the patients who have diabetes are treated. Those with type 1. We say type 1, there is an issue with the secreting of insulin. So if you can inhibit this, you'll be accelerating a lot of, you'll be encouraging a lot of vesicles to be released, meaning more insulin will be released outside in type 1 because the problem is in the pancreas. But you cannot, or in type 2, sorry, in type 2, 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 not type 1. Type 2, the problem is the sensitivity, sensitivity. So a take-home message, I just want you to know the drug that works on here because it can be, it can pop up as an MCQ, okay? All right. Let's now talk about the insulin biochemistry, but don't be a, a detailed biochemist like the biochemist you learned in the biochemist you guys do, okay? It's to just be superficial. Now that I've talked about almost everything, it will be straightforward. We've talked about insulin and uh, the function and how it is produced, but we now have to go a bit molecular and understand this molecule okay we know at this particular point that it is synthesized by the beta cells okay now when it is being synthesized so it's here it's like we're going back to to um the rough endoplasmic reticulum remember the rough endoplasmic reticulum is the one that has to to fold these proteins and then take uh, to take them to the goji apparatus that's it's in short that's the process we want to talk about so when it is produced, when it when it is uh, transcribed, translated actually, when it is translated, it is uh, translated into primary, secondary, and then to be folded. Once it is uh, folded, once it is synthesized, it is synthesized as a pre-pro-insulin. Okay, pre-pro-insulin. Then this pre-pro-insulin has to be cleaved to pro-insulin. Then once it is cleaved, it is now transported to the Golgi apparatus. And then the Golgi apparatus, you know that it is the one that pack packages everything that comes into vesicles. Okay. Once it is goes to the Golgi apparatus, it is now packaged, packaged into the vesicle. And then the pro-insulin is now cleaved into insulin and the C-peptide. Now you see, you've now known where the C-peptide comes from. It was actually part of the insulin. The, the, it was one thing, but do, because of the cleavage and that cleavage, and these things are, they are already in the same vesicle. When the pro-insulin was cleaved, that comma extra part that is now out from the major chain is what we are going to call C-peptide. And that is the reason why whenever you want to tell if there's something wrong with the insulin production, just check the C-peptide and it will tell you. And that is how we even diagnose type 1 diabetes. It is via the C-peptides. Okay? So you can see this is a beautiful diagram showing you the insulin structure. Okay? The one that is in blue, in, in, in carbon, gray or black, this color here, is the one that will end up becoming the C-peptide after cleaving. Okay, so you can see that gray part will be cleaved, and then the orange and the green part, will, there will be some bones that would, uh, would, uh, will be put uh, between the two structures. That happens in the Golgi apparatus as it is a uh, packaging. Then you end up having a, an insulin. This is your insulin here. 
okay at this point you've removed your 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 CPAP right? okay this diagram is I've already talked about it using the overall diagram there whatever is the happening here is the very same thing I was talking about okay Okay, so here insulin released is triggered by glucose. So here again, I was adding some diagrams, uh, just diagrams, just to make the notes a bit beautiful, so they're attractive for you guys to read. Okay, so insulin released, oh, insulin released can be inhibited by these. I need to talk about this. You will definitely find them in your MCQs. So insulin released can be inhibited by the things you see are able to see on your screen. Okay. Epinephrine. Okay, the production of insulin is can be inhibited inhibited by epinephrine. Okay. It can also be um yeah, it can be inhibited by epinephrine. But now remember. Um, I don't know if you guys know at this particular point. I, I don't know if you, you you read that in CVS. There are different types of receptors that, is it CNS or CVS? CNS, yeah. Receptors that uh, the sympathetic system uh, targets. So this is the sympathetic system. So the receptors can be alpha or beta. Okay. So in a case where the beta cells the beta receptors are the ones that have been activated by the sympathetics then what do they do to the insulin the receptors will cause an increase in of insulin in blood what happens if the alpha are the alpha receptors are the ones that have been uh, activated by the sympathetics they will cause the a reduction of insulin in blood okay so a fight or flight so a fight or flight, a flight or fight, you know, the sympathetics are the ones that are activated. But the type of receptors they'll be targeting are the beta 2 receptors, so that you have an increase in insulin. Because a flight or fight mode, you need energy. You need energy for it to escape whatever you, whatever danger you are scared of, okay, because of the flight or fight mode. So, or whenever you're about to write an exam, and then you know that anxiety we get to have, we are in a flight or fight uh, mode, and the beta two receptors are the ones that should be activated to increase insulin, so that it can be uptake of glucose. These are my MCQs that can actually pop up in your exam. Glucokinase. Okay, so I won't talk about. I won't like diving into the details with glucokinase. All you just need to know is that whatever I've talked about so far, uh, uh, where insulin is concerned, the glucose, glu glu uh, oh, sorry, I'm started talking about glucagon. This is glucokinase. Glucokinase is the enzyme which I called exokinase 2, okay? So I won't uh, spend my, most of my time here because I've already talked about this. GLUT2 transporter, um, you already know about this. The one that is found in the beta pancreatic cell, uh, you should know that it is a bi-directional, meaning it can work in either direction, okay? Unlike the ones you find in the intestines and the, and the kidneys, those are unidirectional, okay? So this I've talked about, I've talked about everything. Now, this is a receptor, the insulin receptor. Insulin receptor, remember when insulin is released, it has to now bind to the GLUT2, the GLUT4, right? That's what we said. It has to activate it. Now, the type of receptor that is anchored to the GLUT4 is called the tyros tyrosine kinase receptor. Tyrosine kinase receptor. It's, uh, we already did this under uh, signal in transduction in term one, okay? So here, these diagrams are showing you on how that tyrosine kinase receptor gets to be activated, okay? So two insulin molecules have to bind, and when they bind, the, the lower part of this will be phosphorylated, and then once it is phosphorylated, it then triggers all those reactions that have to happen in the cell, glycolysis and everything, okay? Okay. 
Good four transporters, I've already talked about them. I'm so I've, I've, I've explained almost everything here, so I'm skipping the things I already explained because I was using a diagram to explain almost everything. Okay, insulin dependent organs again, we've explained the red blood cells, good one. Okay, protein synthesis, I've already explained here. Okay. Yes, the lowering of potassium I've explained because of ATP, ATP uh, sodium ATP. So I can say I've covered almost, we're almost done actually. Okay. Uh, and then we now talk about glucagon. Yes, glucagon is what I wanted us to talk about. Okay. So we are done with insulin. At this particular point, you should be expert when it comes to insulin. So it's a matter of just getting this note and going through at your own time. But I've explained everything you need to know as a second year and a third year when it comes to insulin. Okay, glucagon. Uh, glucagon is uh, also a hormone produced by the cells, alpha cells, instead. Not instead, not of the not, the cells that produce glucagon are not beta cells but alpha cells. Okay, the actions are opposite of those seen in insulin. Okay, so I will skip the functions of glucose because it's just the opposite, okay? If glucose was uh, promoting synthesis of proteins, it means glucagon will actually do the opposite, breakdown of proteins into amino acid. If glucose was promoting lipid synthesis, glucagon will, be, will do the opposite by coactivating beta oxidation. Okay, very simple. Now, the uh, this is very important. Uh, the glucagon receptor is a bit different from the one you we see here in, uh, in with insulin. Okay, so it's a G protein receptor, but for insulin, say tyrosine kinase receptor. Those are those are MCQs that can pop up. Okay, these receptors are mostly found in the liver, and that is why the, when the glucagon is released. The liver automatically starts uh, gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis is the opposite of glycolysis, okay, so that you form a lot of glucose. And when that glucose is formed in the liver, it now goes into the blood so that it can go to the muscles and the, anywhere where it's needed. Okay. Hypoglycine. So this glucagon, I already talked about it. In a case someone has hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia mean low levels of glucose. Okay, it's a, it's, a, it's an emergency. When you become a doctor, uh, when you become a clinical student, start seeing patients, you realize that hypoglycemia is an emergency. Hyperglycemia is not an emergency, but hypoglycemia is an emergency. And uh, in a case you want to treat the patient there and then, if you let's assume there is no sugar, there is no glucose anywhere, you can actually give the patient glucagon. If the only drug you have at the hospital is glucagon, inject that, that patient with glucagon and then the patient will actually be saved because you know that glucagon will quickly be distributed within the blood and to tell the, the, the liver to start producing uh, glucose via gluconeogenesis. Okay. So that's so one of the treatments of hypo, hypoglycemia is intramuscular glucagon. But it is always a second or last option. The first option should always be giving someone sugar. So dextrose is sugar. IV meaning, you know, you've been cannulated before. We've seen people with cannulas. We give drugs via, via the IV line. Like that. So that's it means it, the glucose has to go direct into the blood. You don't have to give them oral for them to be saved. Okay. And then another usage of glucagon is the uh, beta blocker overdose. For now, I'll just say memorize it. Like just memorize it as such, and then the understanding will come in when, when you guys, you, you become fourth years and third years when you start doing your uh, ph uh, pharmacology. Insulinoma, I said this is the, um, a cancer, cancer of the, the cancer that is found in the pancreas. Let me say the beta cells, when they become cancerous, they start overproducing insulin. That is what is known as insulinoma. 
So the clinical presentation, patients always uh, always be having hypoglycemia. Okay. Okay. Glau uh, glucago glucagonoma is the is a is a cancer of the alpha cells that are able to produce glucagon. It means it will be the opposite. Yeah? Too much glucose in blood, and this can actually produce glucagonoma can manifest as diabetes because glucagon encourages gluconeogenesis. So there will be a lot of glucose in a, in blood in a patient who has glucagonoma, and the, the, that such a patient can actually end up having diabetes. Okay. All right, now uh, then you can also see the, so main syndrome is an endocrine cancer where all the endocrine cells are produce, overproducing hormones. Imagine the thyroid is overproducing thyroid hormone. The adrenals are overproducing the minocorticoids, are overproducing uh, corticocortic corticosteroids, okay? And then even the pancreas will be produ overproducing the insulin and the like. So this is uh, what is not. So for you as a third year, second year, just take note that uh, cases where you can end up having high levels of insulin and high levels of glucagon at the same time is a disease called as main syndrome. It's a, it, it is, it is a, an abbreviation of multiple endocrine neoplasia where all the endocrine uh, organs in the body, they have uh, cancer and then they're overproducing hormones everywhere. In five minutes, we'll be done. Hypoglycemia. I've already talked about hypoglycemia. Now, I want to talk about it here because there's something I want you to memorize. Kawe, Nkata, you have your hand raised up. You can go ahead. Have written a question like in the comment section. Oh, oh, let me check. I didn't. Sorry, sorry. In a case you mistakenly give a patient dextrose while they are supposed to get it, any side effect? No side effect. Such sugar. So it will be. It will be. Like dextrose is sugar. Okay, but it depends with the percentage because. Um. Depending with the 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 situation. We can give a patient 5% dextrose. We can give a patient 10% dextrose. If let's say you accidentally give a patient 50% dextrose, it will become bad. What is going to happen is what? Hyperosmotic dehydration. The only effect is hyperosmotic dehydration. Remember dextrose is, is an isomer of glucose. So the effect of glucose will, it will be seen in dextrose as well if it is very high by pulling water from the cells to the ECF. So the patient will end up having hyperosmotic um, uh, dehydration. But in a case where I give it 5%, 10%, nothing will really happen. It will be used up, it will be broken down, and uh, the patient will be OK. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Hypoglycemia. So I've already talked about hypoglycemia, but now I have to revisit it here because there are figures I want you to memorize. Okay. By definition, I've, I, I did talk about hypoglycemia and I was just saying low levels of glucose, but you need to know it by definition based on the values. And you know, at this particular point, you even know that these are things you need to memorize. Okay. So by definition, Hypoglycemia is defined by the by two of the following. Right? The first definition is when you find low plasma glucose level less than four millimoles per liter. Or I've added two two you two values here. The other one is in millimoles, the other one is in milligrams per deciliter. So there are times they'll bring you a question in milligrams per deciliter. There are times they'll give you a question in they'll give you a uh, glucose level, sorry, in millimoles, so you can memorize. And it's easy to, okay, just memor for, for what I would say is, memorize the one in millimoles, and whenever you're given the one in milligrams, it's easy, just convert your milligrams into millimoles. How do you do it? By dividing by 18. 
and then convert your deciliter here in two liters. That, that's it. Or whatever are given a uh, glucose levels in milligrams, that's divided by 18. And then convert your deciliter to liter. Then you, you would have uh, converted everything into millimoles, okay? Another de definition is if you have a person who is confused, who has altered level of sensorium or they have su sudden seizures or decreased in uh, concentration, think of hypogee. The first thing, someone who was okay, you know, they suddenly they're just confused. There's decreased uh, like, uh, attention, like I'm teaching and then someone, the, the, the attention has decreased in class. I'll start thinking of hypogea. The first thing I'll ask, did you eat your breakfast? Okay, that is the first thing. Or sudden seizures, think of hypogea. So this second definition, he assumes you don't have your materials to actually check the glucose, the blood, the, uh, the glucose levels in blood. So if you see these signs, start thinking of uh, hypogea. But the one that will come in your exam is this one where you need to memorize the, the value. Like uh, when they bring it on your MCQs, usually the one with the, these, where you need to memorize the levels of uh, glucose, that is the one that can pop up in your exam. Treatment, these are the three possible ways you can treat, okay? So in a case where uh, uh, as a student, you are studying with your friend and then your friend is, you know, people are going through a lot, especially now that you're approaching the exams, you know, people are depressed, you just don't know, people are depressed, uh, people are stressed, so you find that when you are depressed, your appetite goes, you don't want to eat, you just want to start, you are scared. You go to the library without eating the whole day, and then you see someone with signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. The first thing first is buy that person a, a drink, anything. If you have sugar, if it's in your room, get that sucrose and add water and give that person. Okay, so that is the first treatment. 15 grams of oral glucose. Then check after 15 minutes. The pers this person should do. Pick up or recover. Okay. In a case where it was so severe to an extent where this person is unconscious, when a person is unconscious, you have to they have to go to the hospital. Okay. Now when they go to the hospital, when you become fifth years and sixth years, fifth years and fourth years by then, what do you do to such a patient? You give them dextrose, IV. Okay. You have to inject direct into the blood. You have to inject that direct into the blood, okay? 25%, then they will recover. In a case that you don't have IV, maybe you are a doctor like myself, I don't know where I'll be, I'll be posted. Maybe I'm posted in Shangombo where they don't have IV lines, you know, they don't have things. If they can have glucagon, I'll just inject them glucagon in their muscle, and then I would have resuscitated this patient. So I thought of adding this word to make this uh, session interesting. You know, that that is this is learning, not the memorizing you guys have been doing in preparation for your tests, or well, twos and three. Symptoms, so symptoms of hypoglycemia can be divided into three, autonomic meaning autonomic nervous system, neurologic meaning the brain, and the, some of these symptoms cannot be grouped so non-specific. So if you see someone sweating, all of a sudden they are sweating, they have palpitation, meaning pounding heart. They feel very hungry. And then they have anxiety. Just think of uh, hypogee. Okay. Or maybe all of a sudden someone is just confused. Someone was okay. They're just confused. They are drowsy. They are, have problem with uh, speech. Or they have, uh, they are, all of a sudden they've developed uh, an inability to concentrate. Think of hypogee and you as a good friend, what do you do? Buy them with a drink, Coca-Cola, whatever drink that you can afford. You actually go, going to save that person, especially medical students. Because we, we like starving ourselves. You know, we don't that's the reason why life expectancy of medical life expectancy of doctors or medi us medical students or doctors is around sixty because of how we live our lives. Okay. Ever stressed ever seated on books and uh, but you are busy encouraging other people to 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 have a balanced diet to live healthy but you're not doing that yourself we move on to the other part okay 
Diabetes. So diabetes, diabetes, diabetes is the opposite of uh, hypoglycemia, meaning when you have high levels of uh, glucose in blood for a long period of time at a particular, there is a number attached to it, you see it. That's what requires diabetes, okay? So diabetes is a chronic disorder of eleva elevated blood glucose levels. It should be chronic, meaning chronic, meaning it should, for example, if someone had no more glucose levels today, and then five days from now, they end up having elevated glucose levels. I won't call that as it, diabetes. It should just be hyperglycemia. But if that elevated glucose stays for a long time, some months and even years, then it becomes diabetes, okay? And it can be too due to either insufficient insulin, meaning the pancreas, the beta cells are failing to produce insulin, or maybe the insulin is being produced, but the receptors are insensitive. They are not responding to the insulin. Okay? So now these are the numbers I want you to memorize, okay? At this particular point, you should know the normal values of glucose in blood. Okay, I think I gave you a Chimate book, my first when you started the uh, fluids compartment. So the normal levels of glucose in blood, you should know, okay? Now, uh, in order just to advance the bid, you should know when someone is fasting, for example, I haven't eaten, like myself, I haven't eaten from uh, maybe uh, eight hours up to now. That is called fast. If, if someone measures my blood glucose, it will be called fasting blood sugar. Fasting just means this person hasn't eaten for a long time. And if you were to measure glucose in their blood, how much is it, is it expected to be? So they are saying the normal should be at least less than 6.1 if the person was fasting. Okay, random blood sugar. Random blood sugar is where someone has eaten their breakfast, someone has eaten their lunch. They always eat whatever they eat. Then you have to check their blood, their blood uh, glucose. What is the normal value? The normal should be less than seven point eight millimoles. That's what it means. Okay, but in a, if if in, a, in in someone who has diabetes, remember diabetes is elevated glucose. The fasting blood sugar is always more than seven, more than seven. So if you measure fasting blood sh sugar in someone and you find it to be there, normal should be less than six, but you find it to be great. Imagine someone was fasting and then their sugar levels are still high. Then you start thinking this, this is that. That's our actual diagnosis of diabetes. If someone has been eating, you know, they eat their lunch, they eat their supper, and then you find that you do a random blood sugar, a random meaning, at any time, you just do a, a blood sugar. Then you find it to be 11.1 .1 greater than that. In a, uh, you know, start thinking of uh, diabetes, okay? Then there's what is known as hemoglobin A1C. This is very important and it comes in your MCQs, okay? Someone who has elevated glucose in blood for a long time, what is the lifespan of uh, hemoglobin in blood? What is the lifespan of... 120 days. Uh -huh. 120 days, which is equivalent to how many months? <laughs> Basically three months. Three months, good. So now... If someone, has, if someone has elevated, the, yeah, approximately that three to four months. If someone has elevated the glucose for more than if two months to three months, it means glucose, that glucose, what it does is that it starts binding to the hemoglobin within the red blood cells. So if you are to, if you can check the hemoglobin, and if you find that there is glucose attached to the hemoglobin, it's called glycosylated. That's the reason why it's called hemoglobin glycosylated, hemoglobin A glycosylated, okay? When you find that there is glyc uh, glucose attached to the hemoglobin, okay? Now, it's normal for you to find glucose attached to hemoglobin, but if it is greater than 7%, then start thinking 
this person has diabetes because it means that can only happen in a long period of time okay because after three months these red blood cells will die and then new ones will be produced and when the new ones are produced again they find a lot of glucose in blood that glucose goes and binds to the hemoglobin and then you end up having high levels of glycosylated hemoglobins glycosylated hemoglobin is what we use as doctors to check if someone has been compliant with the medication you give a patient with diabetes some medication they go home they don't take those medications we, we tell them to come back after three months we check their hemoglobin you find that hemoglobin the glycos glycosylated uh, hemoglobin they are more than seven percent i will know that this patient hasn't been compliant it can be they haven't been compliant they haven't been compliant or maybe um i mean compliance can be they haven't been taking up medication or they just don't have money to buy the medication it can either be the two okay so uh this is i've talked about this it's about it's all up to you to read for you have for dips i've talked about so for you have for dips automatically those are the symptoms you see in a patient with diabetes polyuria polydipsia and polyphagia and i did explain the science behind polyuria polydipsia polyphagia so someone with diabetes it's easy to, to spot them out they'll be drinking a lot of water and then they'll be going to the toilet a lot, a lot you know because they want to uh, urinate and then eating a lot okay and because they're eating a lot they uh those with type 2 diabetes are usually fat okay they are usually obese because of too much eating you know every time hungry lion every time they're just eating and eating and drinking you can even suspect that this one if i were to do some test up i might find the person has diabetes two type two type two is where insulin is produced but it is insensitive now, what are the risk factors of one having type 2 diabetes? Because you know that in type 2, the receptors are insensitive, not exercising. Remember that the muscles are the ones that picks up glucose. Huh? Now, lack of exercises, it means the muscles or the adipose tissues are not picking up the glucose. There is no need of them to use up that glucose. So over time, they become insensitive to insulin. Lack of exercise, like the way we, you know, you know, our lives as medical students, the way we like, ever seated and the like. Lack of exercise, hypertension, and okay, sometimes it's familiar. Some sometimes you can. Some people have been exercising. They eat healthy diet. They don't like junky food, but because someone has has had diabetes in their family, they need to be they have a susceptible gene so they can also have it so those are some of the risk factors okay but type one is autoimmune your own immune cells will start attacking the beta cells and then they'll be failing to produce insulin so type one is autoimmune your own immune system attacking your beta cells but type two is because of the insensitivity of the receptors i've explained hemoglobin a1c I've explained literally everything here. Type 1, I said it is a hypersensitivity reaction, autoimmune. They'll start attacking the beta cells. I mean, there will be decrease in production of insulin. And when there's decrease in production of insulin, then uh, this person will end up having high, lev high levels of glucose for a long time, and then diabetes. Okay? So it is usually seen in young young persons, like below twenty years. If if in your class, if I, if any of your classmates was to be diagnosed with diabetes type one, it would be if diabetes. So it would be type one because it's common in young adults and children. But diabetes type two is common in older people, 40, 50, and above. It's men who are who have become a pot belly. Pot belly is not good. Okay, pot belly predispose, predisposes us on having type, type type two diabetes. I started developing one, but it's hard to you know to go to the gym or to exercise with the 
trying to survive uh, in school of medicine at Ridgeway campus. Hoping when I start working, I'll have my own gym in, the, in my house. But we should uh, start to become a good habit. Okay, one last thing I want to talk about and we call it a day. The complications of that. Yes, Doc. How then can you define the ability to do diabetes insidious? Ah, good. Diabetes insipidus. So there is this one we're talking about here is diabetes mellitus, and then you have diabetes insipidus. Anyone to, to 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 anyone who knows the difference between these two? Oh, there's a question from Aisha. I'll, I'll get back to you. I've seen your question, Aisha. Anyone to to tell us the difference between diabetes mellitus, which is the one we're talking, and the diabetes insipidus, the one you are probably read when you are when you are studying your uh, renal physiology. Okay, so diabetes insipidus, I actually wrote it for you here. Where is it? I wrote it for you. So diabetes insipidus is where, oh, oh, the terminology is there. Diabetes insipidus, this is where the, kid, the diabetes insipidus is seen in kidneys. The correcting ducts of the kidneys, they respond to ADH. Whenever ADH is produced, the collecting duct will put aquaporins to on the collecting within the collecting duct, and then there will be reabsorption of water. That's what happens. Now, if that hormone is not there, by whatever cause, okay, it's lack of the ADH. Okay, there won't be aquaporins to uh, inserted in the collecting duct, and then this person will end up having polyuria. So diabetes insipidus is when the, the, the collecting duct has been affected. They are failing to respond to the ADA so that aquaporins can be put, so that water can be absorbed. If that system is, fail, is failing, then you end up having what is known as the diabetes insipidus. Diabetes mellitus is what we've been talking about. It has to do with sugar. Mellitus is sugar. Insipidus is water in latin clear i hope it's clear okay all right now i wanted to appreciate uh, a complete some complications of diabetes diabetic ketoacidosis now this is very important because it now links your biochemistry remember i said that uh, lack of oh there was a question from Aisha. So when a person has insulinoma, doesn't Google go somewhat help with what or is it useless in this situation? So when someone has insulinoma, it means those cells they are cancerous. And when you have cancerous cells, it means they will be ever divided. They will be in large numbers to an extent where the amount of insulin being produced cannot be compared to the amount of glucagon being uh, produced. So that glucagon that is being produced won't have any effect against what insulin okay, uh, will be doing, the one that is being produced by the cancer. Cancer is bad because the cells are ever dividing, and because they're ever dividing, when they are producing things, they make sure that they produce those things. So the only way is to cut out, to remove those cells, to kill them, maybe using chemotherapy, or maybe surgery, go and remove the pancreas. Okay, there is another question. What's the hormone that you said we should go and read about? Uh, growth hormone. Okay, go, growth hormone. It's even there in essentials. You can go and just read the comma growth hormone. Pa, 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 pa. You then you, you, it will make sense. And the, take note the functions of cortisol, the functions of cortisol and the growth hormone, they always counteract the effect of insulin. Whenever, whenever cortisol and the growth hormones are high in blood, insulin will 
the effect of insulin will decrease. Okay, so those growth hormones and the growth hormone and the cortisol, they uh, count, they counteract the effect of insulin. So I want you, when you start reading, they'll talk about that. Oh, let me now talk about the diabetic ketoacidosis first, first, guys. So what I just want you to appreciate under diabetic ketoacidosis, how does it come about? If you've been following this class, we said insulin deficiency. What is going to happen uh, when someone has insulin deficiency? Think of those four functions of insulin in the carbohydrates, the lipids, and the proteins. Okay? So now, when someone has insulin deficiency, which is usually type 1, type 1 diabetes, when someone has insulin deficiency for a long time, they will have that hyperglycemia, yes, but that's not even the worry. That's not even the problem. That's not what you'll be worried as a doctor or myself. Like if someone has, we are worried about diabetic ketoacidosis, which is a complication of type 1 diabetes. So what happens? We go back. Insulin promotes lipid synthesis. Lack of insulin means that there is no, the lipid synthesis won't be promoted. Instead, the lipase enzyme will be activated, and then there will be a lot of uh, cleavage of lipids into fatty acids. These uh, fatty acids will go to the liver. The liver will start oxidizing the fatty acids into acetyl CoA and malonyl CoA. A lot of acetyl CoA, some of it will be, of course, the aim of the liver is to convert as many fatty acids into acetyl CoA so that it can now form the low density lipoproteins so that it can form the um, uh, triglycerides. Okay, now it you find that there will be a lot of acetyl CoA such that the liver cannot cope. So, what does it do? Some of the acetyl CoA will be deviated into keto ketogenesis. Ketogenesis it means you start producing ketones. I'm sure you learned that in, in your biochemistry. I'm pretty much sure you learned that. Ketogenesis will produce a lot of ketones, but ketones are acidic. So if a lot of ketones are produced, your, the patient will end up having metabolic acidosis. And that type of metabolic acidosis is called diabetic ketoacidosis. Why? Because of pro overproduction of ketones and over pro yeah, overproduction of ketones that will make the blood acidic. And the worst part about it is that the brain cannot even use up those ketones. Okay, so there will just be a lot in blood and then they'll cause acidosis of blood. That is what is called keto, a diabetic ketoacidosis. Now, this is an emergency. If someone has diabetic ketoacidosis as a doctor, you even have to stop every whatever you are doing just to attend to this place because if not attended to, they will die. Now, for, your, for, your, for the sake of physiology, your physiology, you have to know the diabetic acidosis because of the fact that it is a metabolic acidosis and the, you will have to now relate it with the kidneys how are the kidneys going to respond because the kidneys they always try to regulate the acidosis how is the respiratory system going to respond you know that the brain center the respiratory center whenever there is acidity in, uh, in blood they will respond and then they'll activate breathing someone will start breathing at a faster Right, because this respiratory system is trying to control the levels of acid in blood in blood. That is what is called compensation. If you read my the notes we gave you under uh, drive, you I'm sure you saw some of these things when you are reading between uh, respiration and the um reno. That is the reason why I had to talk about it under physiology. But the disease itself, you are you appreciate it at 40 or 30 okay but these you need to know okay you need to know the all these uh the gamma diagram that the things that can cause the, end up causing the the how diabetic ketoacidosis can can come about okay and then these are the symptoms you know symptoms of, uh, of diabetic ketoacidosis if you don't know even if you don't you don't know them if you, do, if you decide not to know them it's okay but if it comes as a scenario you 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 touch that is if you won't write online if you won't write online you start out you have to be memorizing this because 
you uh you saw you saw that question i i, I gave uh, thyroid eh? they just brought a disease with symptoms in there and then they ask you the the next question was what is the problem in this patient the second question was what is the physiology of that shanshan so in a case you're going to write a physical exam if it is confirmed they're writing a physical exam that is when i'll say start memorizing these signs and symptoms they can never ask them in your true or false but in a case where i'm going to write online it's a matter of memorizing a lot of figures and the uh like he figures like he glucose levels and some of the biochemistry reactions okay i think that's that's it guys okay treatment of diabetic acidosis you give insulin you know the problem here is that there is lack of insulin so how do you treat give insulin and apart from giving insulin what do you do you give fluids because remember this patient has a lot of uh, glucose in blood and i said there is hyperglyce hyperosmotic dehydration so you have to hydrate the patient by giving them no more saline so you give them no more saline then you give them insulin then they'll be okay after some hours or a day as simple as that type 2 diabetes i said the problem is insensitivity okay the muscles are failing to pick up the glucose I said the lack of exercise, sedentary lifestyles, eating junky food, you know, those things are actually predisposed us to diabetes. So it means anyone is at risk of having diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Okay. I think so. Family history, some people, because their mother had it, their, their, their elder brother had it, they are most likely going to have it as well. All right, guys, that, that is it. You are done though so that was it that that is i think if another topic comes uh, comes in the endocrine if we decide to teach another topic before before your, your our exams would be um the ovaries and the testes okay the ovaries and the test is now the physiologist's point of view otherwise you've taught the major the major the major endocrine organs you need to know okay pancreas thyroid as well as the adrenal and then to tell Emma taught the pituitary when he was teaching the the histology okay so he did he talk I talked about the hormones that are produced by the pituitary so you can even watch the camera video all the hormones that are, are produced by the pituitary and the, the functions but the detailed functions of growth hormone is what I gave you as an example are there any questions okay so it's quiet so if there are no questions all the best and i've noticed that people the, the moment the timetable came out to say that you're writing online exam people have already started coming up with sensitiums they're already uh inboxing other people to write on their behalf guys it's going to be bad you might escape this maybe if the exams become online and then you give a senior like myself to write for you and then you pass but it will catch up with you it will catch up with you in a case where they decide to say uh, yeah, the exam will still be online and you decide to do whatever you want to do but in a case where you are in a relaxed form because you've already formed the sensitivity with your friend thinking you are going to write your, with your friend and then seen it dis disapprove uh, whatever they said and then now you only have one week study break it's again going to be bad so just assume the exam is physical not until the final draft comes out because no one knows and in a, even if the final draft comes out and it's online try by all means to study as if you are writing it physical because it's for your own good trust me fourth day is bad you think like third day and second days but fourth day is bad fourth day is bad and all the courses are like anatomy each course there are just four by the way but each course is like anatomy it has four components so it will just be bad because your foundation would have been for you to understand for the courses you need this foundation so don't don't make your life hard in medicine try by all means to understand this as you are even if you use that opportunity to charge yes to charge and the like but still be studying that is my advice as a senior from you to you guys uh juniors okay uh, why is it? uh that is it for today and have a good evening
Doc. Yes, uh, is it Salome? Yes. If yes. it happens that exams will be online, do you have any recommendable sites where we can access?